Uh, the Deputy Leader of New Zealand First and Minister of Regional Development, I'm pretty sure it is in this setting. Shane Jones broke the story uh, quite some time ago that the government was going to introduce fast-track legislation for significant projects. Um, the inter- the, we talked to Chris Bishop about this uh, last week. It's been introduced to the House. And, oh, my God, the, the screeches of anti-democratic Nazism that have come from particularly the woke left media. This is going to ride roughshod of the environment. It is probably the worst thing the Coalition of Chaos has ever done. What do you say to those critics, Shane Jones? Hey, morning, folks. Well, I've been dubbed the new Muldoon in That's Kaitaia. Right. Yeah. In Kaitaia and a variety of other places in Northland. That's probably a cloak of glory. Yeah, well... Isn't there some validity in the criticism that you are getting around democratic processes? And in particular, uh, it's been said that projects that were turned down or didn't get resource consent because of environmental concerns will now be rammed through. Well, let's remind all of the listeners that when the nation votes, there are consequences. We campaigned on this initiative. We put it in the coalition agreement. There is nothing surreptitious. There is nothing uh, hidden about what New Zealand First is trying to do. There are trade-offs to be made. The reference to certain projects that may have gone through a legal process, like the salmon farm down in um, Stewart Island, largely have failed on the basis of unelected grandees, unaccountable making decisions which are value-based on landscape values. Well, if you're having value-based decisions, there's nothing wrong with politicians who face the ultimate sanction in three years' time making those calls. These are not narrow matters of deep law. Who said that the existence of an industry, the future proof of region, is of less importance than landscape values in an obscure part in a tiny island where hardly anyone lives, otherwise known as Stuart Island. All right. Um, But why did we set up the checks and balances of resource management in the first place? Why get rid of them? Surely the Parliament of the day uh, gave great consideration to the current regime. All regimes of a statutory character become calcified. The Resource Management Act, initially kicked off by Geoffrey Palmer, eventually passed by Simon Upton in 1991, uh, traceable back to the Town and Country Planning Act, has been around for the thick end of 30 plus years. It is overdue for panel beating. All this bill does is create a platform and a statutory corridor with decisions on very critical projects that will have a major impact on resilience and productivity in regions and on occasion national projects can be dealt with in a bespoke way. There is nothing unusual about that. This bill is based on David Parker's bill in 2020, which I helped him write. This bill builds on what Chris Finlayson did with a bespoke piece of legislation to deliver the Anzac Memorial at Basin Reserve. This is not the first time that a government has said, right, we're confronted with an infrastructure deficit and crisis. And sadly, we're in the grip of a paralysis where the law, the environmental law, is regularly weaponized by the NGOs who hate infrastructure development, absolutely loathe mining. And we've got to move beyond that Kardashian level of commentary that mining is negative and evil and will destroy the environment. All right, so so I'm just... Let's, no, 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 as yeah. you and I talk, no, no, Sean, yeah. as you and I talk, yeah. there are New Zealanders getting up this morning, mining on the Dock Estate. This is already happening, mate. All right, so so let's look at some hypothetical examples, and I know there's a danger in that, and I, I won't hold you to it. Would this apply to, say, a major new coal mining um, thing on the West Coast? If I some, hope so. Wow. Okay, so that's a Yes. Would this apply to a new waterfront stadium in Auckland? Well, that would depend whether it met the uh, met the criteria of um, productivity and resilience. But um, at the moment, the scope is broad enough to cope with such a project. Wow. 
Um, so you're saying almost nothing would be off the table if it was in the national interest, if it helped grow the economy, stabilise or future-proof a region in an economic or infrastructure sense. Can I just ask you a question, um, Sean? Help me understand this. Mm. If we have a, a massive natural resource, whether it's gold, whether it's critical mm. rare earth minerals, or whether it's coking coal, why is it now morally reprehensible to close uh, for those industries not to continue generating international revenue given we've got a crippling current deficit? W what's the moral case? Yeah, well, the moral case is that you're on the left. Rich is bad, money bad, compulsion good. Um, sorry, that's just my, my personal view, uh, to be honest. So, so, so a project, whether it's gold or coal or any other mining project, obviously the conditions will have to be such mm. that once the mining is over, the mitigation takes place. But mm. there's some trade-offs to be made here. I mean, we have imported a veritable mountain of Indonesian coal so we can keep the lights on well into 2024. But um, I never hear anyone from the other side of the House, in particular the Green Party, acknowledge in the absence of that coal we won't have a modern electricity system. Yet we're not allowed to continue digging up what is a valuable New Zealand resource and sending it because it's a cleaner type of coal than other parts of the world. This Cardassian uh, emerald analysis has to come and go. Mm. All right. Um, and are you surprised at the criticism you've got from the likes of Rod Oram and Mark Dalder and the rest of the, of the pearl clutches in the media or not? Oh, look, I, I, I just take it for what it is, mate. I mean, these are, I accept these are political debating points. But I say to them, go and talk to your fellow New Zealanders before you continue to proselytise. And if you really want a role as a climate missionary then step out of the media. The media is not interested any longer, and I'm not interested in this level of proselytisation. We have a genuine economic set of dangerous challenges in New Zealand. Our party is willing to make hard and very, very difficult decisions to turbocharge the economy, whether it's in aquafarming, whether it's re-establishing mining, just look at the parlous state of our international revenue and our current account deficit. I don't care if I sound pointy-headed saying this. That is the measure that international investors use to ascertain whether or not this is still an economy which they can pour dough into because we live on debt. And we've got, we've got these, um, these climate geckos who continually intimidate, uh, sensationalise and, 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 quite frankly, hyperbolise. We've got to take a measured approach, learn to adapt with changing weather and stop trying to close down the economy for a, for, for a tiny... For, for, yep. for, for a and tiny as Chris Bishop, I'm sure you're in lockstep with... Yeah, I'm sure you're in lockstep with Chris Bishop. He says, if you don't like it, vote us out next time.